in uh, days. On uh, Friday, we have a lecture by uh, David Gouvia, who will be talking about crafting scientific narratives. David Sayer, we're looking forward to uh, her talk. On uh, Tuesday, there's a French person, sorry to impose a lot of French on you, this, day, <laughs> this week's uh, Brice Bantigny will be talking about where the philosophy of cognitive science went, uh, went uh, wrong. So more philosophy of coxi in uh, at the center next uh, next week. Uh, today is my uh, great pleasure to introduce Mathias Michel, uh, who is currently a postdoctoral researcher at, the, at NYU, New York uh, University. Been there for now uh, three years, um, and he was formerly a there a best of faculty fellow there. Now regular postdoctoral researcher. He got his PhD in 2019 in France with Anu Barberus on uh, a dissertation focusing on the epistemology of consciousness science, and he's published extremely widely in uh, all the best journals in both philosophy and uh, science. Uh, it's published in Journal of Consciousness Studies, Nature Review, Psychology, Molecular Psychiatry, Man and Language, Philosophy of Science, Academies, Nature, Human Behavior, and so on and so forth, uh, around topic related to uh, consciousness and other and other topics. But today we're going to move slightly away from consciousness, um, not completely unrelated because if you know uh, Matthias' work, it's a lot of focus on the measurement of consciousness. It's, it's not not unrelated to this kind of question, but it's going to be about validity drifts in psychiatric research. Matthias, thanks for thanks for coming. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I really look forward to your uh, comments and questions. Um, so this is very much a work in progress, as it was said. This is not my specialty, uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, things that I don't know all that well. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe some of the things I'm going to say are either obviously true in the best case or maybe obviously wrong. <laughs> All right, so um, psychiatric research uh, is in crisis right now, uh, and in particular psychiatric drug development. Uh, that's been said multiple times in, uh, you know, science, nature, even the New Yorker. Uh, so ultimately, this crisis is well summarized in this quote by Fibiger, who writes, the data are in, and it is clear that a massive experiment has failed. Despite decades of research and billions of dollars invested, not a single mechanistically novel drug has reached the psychiatric market in more than 30 years. So basically what's happening is that the new drugs that are developed right now for psychiatric disorders are mostly barely updated versions of drugs that were dis discovered mostly by chance in the 50s and 60s. Okay? And uh, the situation is so bad that uh, the main pharmaceutical companies uh, like AstraZeneca and all that um, have just stopped investing in the development of new drugs for uh, psychiatric disorders. So that's very bad because psychiatric disorders will would like a way of, of um, making people feel better, you know? <laughs> and uh, it seems like there's just no progress in this, in this domain. So what I'm going to argue is that this crisis is in part due to a measurement problem that I call validity drift. So I'm going to explain what that is in a minute, but my hope is that a study of this kind of anti-hero of, um, of science will shed light on several aspects of measurement. In particular, I hope that studying psychiatric research will help us understand how scientists can develop valid measurement procedures. In other words, I think that studying how things might go wrong will help us, uh, will kind of reveal some of the conditions for valid measurements in, in science. So it's just a banality to say that um, developing new measurement procedures is hard, and that's because many things could go wrong when you develop a measurement procedure. In particular, they could go wrong in two main ways. Um, um, things could go wrong with respect to accuracy or validity, and or validity. 
So for accuracy, I'm going to use the definition of the VIM, the International Vocabulary of Metrology, uh, which says that accuracy is the closeness of agreement between a measured quantity value and the true quantity value of the measurement. So the measurement is the stuff you want to measure. And for validity, I'm going to use, uh, so the definition of validity, validity is a bit more controversial. Uh, I'm going to use the definition of both boom and colleagues, which you had here at some point, I've been told, uh, in 2004, which says that a test is valid for measuring an attribute if and only if, uh, first, the attribute exists, you can't measure something that doesn't exist, and B, variations in the attribute causally produce variations in the outcomes of the measurement procedure. Okay. So I don't think that much of what I'll say really depends on those definitions, uh, but um, we can talk about that later on in, in the Q&A. Um, for now, what I want to do is emphasize how hard it is to assess both validity and accuracy. So in the case of accuracy, we face a fundamental problem, which is the following. Uh, how would you know whether your procedure is accurate or not, given that presumably you don't know the true value of the measurements, right? I mean, if you knew, you wouldn't need measurements. <laughs> So uh, there's been a lot of uh, work by Hazok Chang uh, on this problem, notably famously in the case of temperature. Um, there's also a fundamental problem in the case of validity. Here the prob problem is, how would we know whether the procedure is valid, given that presumably at the start of our scientific uh, research, we only have a vague idea of the nature of the construct we are studying. So when you develop new measurement procedures, presumably you don't know much about the construct of interest. Presumably you don't really know whether um, how the construct of interest is interacting uh, with the measurement procedure itself. And that makes it difficult to know whether um, the procedure is valid or not. So this problem is very well illustrated in another case, in the case of the measurement of well-being, for instance, by Anna Alexandrova. Um, so that's a, a tough problem to solve. So in this talk, I'm going to leave aside uh, accuracy and focus mainly on how things could go wrong with respect to validity, namely whether we measure the stuff we wanted to measure in the first place. And in particular, I'm going to focus on one specific way in which things could go wrong, uh, which I call validity drifts. Uh, and I don't think they have been very much emphasized in the literature on measurement so far, uh, but I think they are quite important. So in a nutshell, a validity drift occurs when in the course of developing new measurement procedures, researchers end up studying something different from what they originally, originally aimed to study. So that's what a validity drift is. So in this talk, I really want to flesh out this notion of validity drift. I'm going to start by connecting that notion to an idea developed by Hazok Cheng, namely the idea of metrological extension. After that, I'm going to illustrate validity drift with the case of psychiatric research, most notably focusing on the case of non-human animal models um, and drug testing in non-human animals. And so in the paper that I'm writing on this, I'm also talking about uh, cases of validity, validity drifts purely in humans, most notably with the case of uh, fear and anxiety disorders, but uh, I'm not going to talk about this today because that would be too long. Uh, but we can talk about this in the Q&A if you're interested. All right. So the main cases of validity drifts that I'm going to consider today occur in cases that Hazok Chang has called metrological extension cases. So here's how he defines a uh, metrological extension. He writes, we start with a concept um, that has a well-established method of measurement in a domain of phenomena. A met metrological extension is made when we make the concept measurable in a new domain. By definition, a metrological extension requires a new standard of measurement and one that is connected to the old standard in some coherent way. So some of the cases that he considers are uh, the measurement of temperature beyond the point, boiling point of mercury. If you only have mercury thermometers, or if your best thermometers are mercury thermometers, how do you measure temperature beyond that point? 
Another case that's interested is the case studied by uh, Percy Bridgman, um, namely the measurement of pressure beyond the point where pressure gouges break down. How do you do that? And um, But interestingly, if you think about this for five minutes, um, um, psychology features some of probably some of the most interesting cases of, of um, metrological extensions because almost all of um, psycho psychological studies in non-human or rather in non-communicating uh, animals, namely non-human animals and human babies, are basically all cases of metrological extensions, right? Each time you want to measure a, a psychological construct in, um, in non-communicating animals, you'll need some way of, of measuring that construct that's presumably going to differ from the ways in which we measure that construct in communicating humans. Okay. So think about you know, developmental psychologists, for instance. Developmental psychologists are going to attempt to measure constructs um, such as working memory or things like that, habituation, with looking time. So they are going to um, measure the construct that we measure in humans with other tasks, uh, in babies with a metrological extension, for example, by using looking time. Okay. All right. Now, the thing is that metrological extension is pretty tricky. Uh, basically, again, we face two fundamental problems. The first one is related to the accuracy of the new measurement procedure. Uh, how can we assess the accuracy of the new measurement procedure in the case of metrological extension, given that presumably we don't have a good standard in that domain already? And second, how do we know that we're still measuring the same construct in that new domain? So um, I think these questions are relative, relatively straightforward to answer in cases like temperature, pressure, and distance, uh, which are so it's not easy to answer these questions, but it's relatively more straightforward than in the other cases I'm cons considering. So if you read the, you know, uh, inventing temperature, like Hazok Chen goes like, 30 pages of explaining how we do that in the case of temperature. So, so I'm not saying it's easy, but it's relatively easier. Um, and that's for two reasons, <clears throat> I think. The first one is what uh, Hazok Chen calls the overlap condition. So he writes, if the original standard and the new standard have an overlapping domain of application, they should yield measurement results that are consistent with each other. So in many, many cases, in, in cases like temperature, pressure, or distance, you're going to have overlapping domains of application. So you can compare the results in those, uh, in those cases. And another case, uh, reason is that um, it's just phase validity. So, for instance, in the case of temperature, it's just obvious that temperature continues to increase beyond the point of beyond, beyond the point of beyond the boiling point of mercury. It's just obvious. <laughs> and it would be a miracle if, by chance, like temperature just stopped increasing after after the boiling point. Okay. So it's just obvious that uh, in that new domain, the construct is. Is there. So to illustrate, suppose that you have a method for measuring distance like telemetry. So telemetry, you, you send a signal and you wait until, <laughs> until you, you get the signal back. So you can uh, measure distances up to uh, 10 to the power of nine kilometers with uh, this measurement procedure. And of course, you might want to measure this distances <laughs> that, are, that are higher than this. Um, and so what you want to do is a metrological extension. And uh, what you can use in that case is a parallax method, but will allow you to uh, measure distances up to, I think, a thousand years, uh, a thousand light years, something like that. And then you can use the parallax method to calibrate other methods, like um, using Cepheid variables and all that. You, can, you, you go farther and farther and farther. So uh, what's important is that you can calibrate the parallax method with the with telemetry because you have this domain of overlap. So you can verify that they give, give the same result. And a kind of trivial thing to note, but still important, is that 
In both cases, distance is measured. Okay. There's no question of whether the parallax method measures one thing and the and telemetry measures another thing. Okay. We know distance is measured in both cases. So we have strong reasons to think that the parallax method is valid too. Now, suppose that you don't have those two conditions. Suppose first that there's no domain of, of overlap between the two procedures. And suppose also um, that we are not even sure that the construct of interest really exists in the new domain uh, that we are studying. Here, it's not really clear what would guarantee that the two procedures measure the same construct. In other words, in cases like this one, it's much more likely that the methodological extension will fail. Either that you're not going to be able to determine whether you, your new procedure is accurate or not because you don't have these overlap cases, or that maybe your procedure measures something, but not the thing you wanted to measure with the first procedure. Okay. So that would be a, a failed case of methodological extension. So to sum up, you have two kinds of cases. The good cases where there's an overlap uh, between the domains, where it's clear that the construct is equally present between the domains, and the bad cases where there's no overlap between the domains, and it's also not clear that the construct is present in the domain that we selected as the target for the methodological extension. Okay. Now, my view is that most cases of methodological extension in psychiatric research are like those bad cases. They are like those bad cases, and in those conditions, validity drifts are much more likely to occur. So, in other words, you could think of validity drifts as failed methodological extensions, cases where you want to measure the construct of interest in a new domain by creating a new procedure, but you're actually not measuring what you wanted to measure anymore, um, namely what you wanted, what you used to measure in the in the old domain. Okay. okay. So take the measurement of major depressive disorders, for example. In that case, one scale you can use in humans is the Montgomery Asberg Depression Rating Scale or Madras Scale. So here you can see uh, some of the items on that on that scale. Uh, they are a mix of uh, self reports and observations by the clinician. And ultimately, all this stuff is combined into a global score that you use as an indicator of depression. That's the procedure. Now, um, suppose that you want to develop a procedure that will measure the same construct in animal models uh, in order to test a new drug for depression. Okay. You want to cure depression. You don't want to test that drug in humans, obviously, uh, or maybe not that obviously, but uh, yeah, <laughs> you want to test the drug in animal models first to make, make, make sure it, it works. <clears throat> and um, so you need a, a, a methodological extension, right? Because obviously you're not going to use the Madras scale in non-human animals because non-human non animals can't report about their suicidal thoughts and uh, their feeling of lassitude and so on and so forth. So again, ideally you'd have uh, an area of overlap like this where you could compare the results of the Madras scale and the result of your new procedure. Mm -hmm. But obviously, again, we, we don't have that. That's because the way depression is assessed with the Madras scale requires those self-reports that we don't have in animals. So here we don't have an overlapping domain of uh, a domain where the procedures will, will overlap. And furthermore, um, if you think about it, is it really clear that um, all those animals will have major depressive disorders. Um, so for instance, is it clear that mice can really have major depressive disorders? Not that clear. If you think it's completely trivial, think about this case, zebrafish models of major depressive disorders. Can zebrafish have major depressive disorders? Who knows? I don't know. Zebrafish are used in uh, the study of major depressive disorders now. Okay. So it's not clear that the construct of interest is present in those animal models. So not only we don't have overlap, 
that would allow us to make sure that the scale is accurate, but also uh, we have doubts about the presence of the construct in the first place. So ultimately, we should expect metrological extensions to be particularly difficult in psychiatric research, especially for drug development. First, because there's no overlap in domains between humans and non-human animals. And second, because it's not always certain that animal models can instantiate the relevant construct. And so with respect to this uh, last pro problem, you, you can see that this, this is going to be very, very difficult to assess, right? Because in order to assess whether they have, they instantiate the construct, we need to be able to measure it, right? So we have kind of a, a circle here. That's a bit annoying. So at this point, I think it's helpful to distinguish between two aspects of validity in these cases. And unfortunately, I don't think they're distinguished all that much in the in, all that much in the literature on animal models. One aspect is the validity of the model itself. And the, the other aspect is the validity of the measurements performed on those models. So here's the case. Uh, it's clear that jellyfish are not a valid animal model for the study of dyslexia. <laughs> you can't study dyslexia in jellyfish. Uh, indeed, remember our definition of validity. Um, a test is valid uh, for measuring an attribute if the attribute exists. So that means that for all non-valid models, there's no possible valid measurement, right? Since you can't have dyslexia in jellyfish, you can't measure dyslexia in jellyfish. So that's almost trivial. Now, the problem, just as a side note, is that um, how do we decide whether jellyfish or zebrafish or mice are valid models. Most of the time, it's done by phase validity. The model just looks like it instantiates some of the features of depression. And therefore, we're going to say, aha, that's a valid model of depression. Of course, in the case of um, jellyfish, no one would think that. So that's why it's a stupid case. But um, you know, in other cases, you could have something that looks like depression. Now, I, I, I don't want to say that uh, psychiatric research is just just based on, on phase validity, but most of the efforts um, are just follow phase validity. Yeah. So if you look at this literature on the validation efforts of those animal models, and you compare this to cases like comparative psychology, where people have spent decades trying to know whether, I don't know, gorillas have um, theory of mind or metacognition, you realize that this literature on the validation of, of, um, of animal models in the case of psychiatry looks pretty pathetic in comparison. It's mostly based on face validity again. Um, it doesn't involve ethologists, for example, or not always, who would, people who know about animal behavior and so on and so forth. It's just mostly done by um, doctors. By that, I mean actual doctors. <laughs> yeah. But let's just assume that uh, we have valid models. Let's just assume that a model like stressed out rats is a valid model for fear and anxiety disorders. I'm not saying that's the case, but let's just assume this. What's very important to recognize is that this does not guarantee that all measurements performed in those models are going to be valid measurements. So to take an extreme example again, um, imagine that you measure that the model is valid, namely that rats can have anxiety disorders and you have a rat with an anxiety disorder and you measure anxiety disorder by the rate of growth of their fingernails, for example. Do they have finger claws? Yeah, claws. Yeah. So that would not be a valid measure, even though your model is valid, right? And uh, so we have this other aspect in our definition of uh, validity. You need variations in the attribute to causally uh, 
produce variations in the outcomes of the measurement procedure, or at, at the very least to correlate with um, pretty well with variations in the uh, outcome of the measurement procedure. Okay, so in summary, you can't have valid measurements in invalid models, so that's pretty clear and intuitive, but uh, what's not so often recognized is that um, a valid model does not at all guarantee valid measurements. So now I'm going to leave the validity of the models aside and focus mostly on the validity of the measurements in those models. So now focusing on the validity of the measurements, it's important to draw yet another <laughs> distinction between valid measurements of the target construct and valid measurements of traits often associated with the construct. So here are a few examples. It's one thing to have a valid measurement of depression. It's another thing to have measurement of despair or behavior, what people call behavioral despair. It's one thing to have uh, a valid measurement of obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD. It's another thing to have a valid measurement of repetitive behavior. It's one thing to have um, valid measurement of ADHD. It's another thing to have a valid measurement of uh, impulsivity. So there's a distinction between valid measurement of a trait and valid measurement of the target construct. Now, uh, this is where things tend to go wrong in psychiatric research. So I'm now going to present a series of case studies uh, where things go wrong, but in different ways. And the first one I'm going to present is a case where there's no valid measurement at all. So no valid measurement for the traits and no valid measurement for the um, constraints. So I'm going to start with the case of uh, the measurement of depression with the, the infamous false, false swim task. Uh, who knows about this task? So here's how it goes. Uh, it's pretty cool. So this is a task that has been um, used in thousands, literally thousands of studies testing for the effect of antidepressants. Really thousands of studies. If you've taken antidepressants in your life, there's a very, very good chance that it was first tested in this way. So here's how it goes. Uh, very, very simple. You put a mouse in a water container from which it cannot escape, and you just see how long it struggles until it lets itself drown. That's the, and then the, that amount of time is going to be your measure of depression, of behavioral despair. Okay. And what we observe is that antidepressants uh, reduce the time, uh, in, it, sorry, increase the time before immobility. immobility. It increases the time in, during which the mouse is going to struggle. All right. So the interpretation is that, look, antidepressants delay immobility because they reduce behavioral despair. All right, so many problems uh, with this interpretation have been, known, have been known for a while. Uh, so here's a recent uh, review by Armario. So he write, uh, there were numerous, numerous false positive results, particularly with psychostimulants. Of course, you imagine what psychostimulants would, psychostimulants would do in this task. Nice. Obviously, yeah, struggle a, a, a bit longer. Uh, second, it was typically found negative results with antidepressants acting mainly through the inhibition of serotonin reuptake. So it doesn't work with all antidepressants. And third, a positive response was observed with acute subacute treatments in contrast to the well-known delayed period to effectively reduce symptoms observed in the clinic. So what this last passage means is that in humans, antidepressants take a while in order to work. So you have to take antidepressants for two, three weeks in order to see the effects. In mice, you, you give the anti antidepressants and boom, you see the effect immediately. So there seems to be a pretty strong disanalogy between the two cases here. Um, and a popular alternative interpretation is that what's happening in the false swim test uh, is that it evaluates the reliance on two strategies that are both adaptive, a passive coping versus active coping strategy. Basically, the idea is that if you know you can't escape and you're a mouse, it might be adaptive to just save your energy and just try to float. So that's um, 
So, so on this view, if that's your view, then the test doesn't measure behavioral despair at all. It measures a tendency to rely on one strategy versus the other strategy. And so now this seems like it seems like this interpretation is the main interpretation of what's going on. But uh, psychiatric researchers still use the fourth swim test as a measure of depression. So as Armar, you're right, the analysis of the literature strongly supports the argument that uh, the FST for swim test essentially evaluates coping strategy and the behavioral despair in accordance with recent reviews. It is therefore difficult to understand why some authors still consider the FST as an animal model for depression, that is, that exposure to false swim induces some kind of depression like state. So that's an extreme case where a very, very, very popular measure uh, not only fails to measure the relevant construct, but isn't even valid for measuring a trait associated with the construct, namely despair. I'm now going to discuss a less extreme case uh, where there's valid measurement. Um, I think there's good evidence for a valid measurement of a trait associated with a construct, but the trait itself is non-diagnostic of the construct. Okay, so you can't go from the presence of that, that trait to the presence of the relevant construct, which in that case is going to be OCD, obsessive compulsive, obsessive -compulsive disorder. So, um, the so relevant trait in that case is trichotillomania, uh, which is hair pulling, um, which um, yeah, in humans happens in, in quite, it's, it's pretty frequent, actually. Um, and that is a trait that is often associated with OCD. Yeah. But it is importantly different from OCD. Many, many people have OCD without it. Um, and some cases of trichotillomania are not really considered cases of OCD. Now, there's a, 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 a behavior in mice and rats or in rodents that is pretty analogous to this, um, that shows many, many similarities. So, um, if you, so, so that's the behavior of barbering, namely uh, fur and whisker pulling. And it shows many, many similarities. Uh, for example, it happens, there's a female bias where um, they're mo mo more likely to do it. Um, and uh, also it happens more during uh, reproductive periods and, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> so um, Garner, who is one of the main experts on trichotillomania, says that um, we have a pretty good model in mice of trichotillomania. So that seems like a case where we're pretty sure what's happening. Another thing is that um, you could see why it's easier to have um, a metrological extension in the case of trichotillomania, right? Because it doesn't depend on self-reports. It's just, it's just purely behavioral. Now, uh, the problem is that barbering is often interpreted as indicating OCD-like, so obsessive compulsive disorder, like behavior. And when people test for drugs for um, reducing OCD, they're testing the drug and seeing the effect on barbering. So if you have a reduction in barbering, that's interpreting, interpreted as a reduction of OCD. However, a diagnosis of OCD is not possible based on trichotillomania alone. So that's something that, uh, again, Garner, main specialist on trichotillomania, writes. He writes, at the most extreme, researchers will latch on to completely superficial behavioral similarities, label them like, and actually use behaviors in mice that would indicate differential diagnosis in humans. So the best example of this is OCD, where any vaguely repetitive behavior in mice is referred to as OCD-like. Unfortunately, repetitive behavior stereotypes and body-focused repetitive behavior disorders like trichotillomania are all exclusionary differentials. So what that means is that if the present presenting behavioral symptom is a case of trichotillomania, a, a diagnosis of OCD is not possible. Okay. So you can't diagnose OCD just based on what you mean. Uh, he writes, such models may throw light on physiology common to repetitive behavioral disorders, including OCD, but they cannot be a valid model of OCD specifically. So in some cases, uh, measurement isn't valid at all. In other cases, measurement is valid for a different construct, like trichotillomania but not for the construct 
that we aim to manipulate or aim to study in that case policy. Finally, in other cases, researchers will indeed measure the relevant construct, but not the relevant pathology. Uh, and here I'm going to focus on the case of the elevated plus maze for testing drugs for anxiety disorders, namely a pathology. So the elevated drug maze is this task uh, that's very, very simple, like almost all of these tasks. Um, you put a rodent in this maze, it's not a very difficult maze, um, which has closed arms and open arms. Mice love those closed arms, but they also have a tendency to explore because that's how they are. Um, and they, they don't like those open arms because it's dangerous for them. Right. So um, here's what people who are experts on this task, right? Behavior in this task, namely activity in the open arms. Oh, sorry, I forgot to say. You measure the activity in open versus closed arms. That's what you mean. So they write behavior in this task reflects a conflict between the rodents' preference for protected areas and their innate motivation to explore novel environments. Here's what they say then. Anti-anxiety behavior is determined by increased open arm time and or open arm entries. The elevated plus maze has phase validity. For instance, in the elevated plus maze, the anxiety or fear of open spaces slash heights of rodents seems to be measured. So, so I'm not sure I see really why that's phase valid, but okay, let's, let's go with it. So that's an extremely popular uh, task to investigate fear and anxiety disorders. Again, I insist on anxiety disorders. Uh, there are more than 2,000 papers uh, using this task. But at the same time, there's a general recognition that the task assesses normal anxiety, not pathological anxiety. Many, many cases of anxiety, you know, anxiety might be adaptive. You might have cases of anxiety just that are just normal. Um, so here's what uh, Maximino and Van der Stey say in a really authoritative, authoritative review on uh, animal models. They write, the elevated plus maze is commonly used to understand non-pathological anxiety. And its use in inferring mechanisms of pathological anxiety is limited. So it seems like that's a case where we are not, if you're testing a drug, on anxiety in that case, you're not really testing the drug, the effects of the drug on what you really want to study, namely pathological cases of anxiety. You're just testing the drug on anxiety. So uh, I think these are good candidates for validity drifts in psychiatric research. Uh, there are many more cases, but um, they are just illustrative cases of different ways in which things can go wrong. Um, Cases where that's very, very bad to cases where that's more acceptable. Um, so in one case, um, we think we are going to study depression and we have our measurement procedure and we measure some kind of thing in rats and mice in animal models. And it turns out what we are really measuring is coping strategies. So differences in coping strategies in the first swim test. So that, that's a validity, validity drift. In another case, we think we're going to study OCD. Then we develop measurement procedures based on the amount of barbering. But really what we're studying is not OCD itself, it's trichotillomania. In another case, we want to measure anxiety disorders and test the effect of drugs on anxiety disorders. And what we're already studying is normal anxiety. Now, at this point, I've seen many researchers in the literature say that they're not really studying depression or anxiety, anxiety disorders or OCD, but just depression-like and anxiety-like behavior or OCD-like. So uh, the problem with this has been pointed out by Garner again uh, in 2014. So he writes, the word like, as in OCD-like or anxiety-like, has become pervasive in behavioral neuroscience, and that's true. If you read this literature, it is everywhere. Everything is OCD-like. 
but it represents an incredible an incredibly dangerous slip in logic the trap is simple to understand calling a measure like does not make it so that is that, that's an empirical issue of validity calling a measure like is a rhetorical device that gives the measure a sheen of respectability and scientific caution when in truth masking the fact that no attempt has been made to validate the measure or that it is being used despite being known to be invalid like the force swim test so people will say oh no the force swim test okay we we all agree it doesn't really measure depression but it measures a depression lag right so the trap is that although the initial lag may be well intentioned as a kind of placeholder for the need to validate with enough publications the measure slips into perception as being validated in other words uh, like takes the place of empirical validation I, I, I want to give some defense of this like locution uh, that could go something like this look even if there's no valid measurement of the constraints of interest um, but in measurement of a trait that is associated with the construct isn't all that bad. You know, there's a sense in which trichotillomania is OCD like because it's kind of associated with OCD. Uh, so it's still relevant, somehow relevant to uh, understand the pathology. So at this point, I think there's a very interesting link between this research on validity drifts and the way in which we think about the nature of psychopathology in general, which is this debate between disease model and network models of psychopathology. So I've been told you you had Ico Fried here. Yeah. So that's his thing. <clears throat> right, so uh, for those who don't know about this debate, According to the disease model, each symptom or trait associated with a mental mental pathology has a common cause, namely the disorder itself. So disorder that causes all those symptoms. So for instance, in the case of depression, difficulties to sleep or suicidal thoughts are just symptoms that are caused by the thing itself, depression. So from this perspective, uh, following the disease model each symptom if you think about measurement now each symptom is caused by the mental disorder it can be used as an indicator a measurement indicator of the disorder itself so studying ocd like or depression like traits ultimately might reveal something about uh, the underlying mental disorder or at least you can use those traits to um as, as indicators of the disorder you're studying. But uh, as many of you know, recently there's an alternative model of psychopathology that has been developed by people like Danny Borsboom or Echo Fried. So according to this model, uh, a disorder like depression isn't a kind of um, latent variable that causes all those um, symptoms. Instead, the disorder itself just is the set of symptoms or traits and their interactions. That's what depression is. So here's an example of a network constructed in the case of depression. <clears throat> uh, you can see how the different symptoms relate to each other. It's not like there's one thing, depression, that causes all of these traits. Depression is these traits and their interactions. Now, if you, from this perspective, a single symptom cannot be interpreted as an indicator of a mental disorder, right? Because the symptom takes its meaning from the interactions. The symptom cannot be interpreted in isolation as an indicator of the disorder. So studying depression-like or OCD-like traits in isolation does not really reveal, reveal much about the disorder. So we should think that these traits, so that, yeah, that's because these traits get their meaning from, with, for the disorder, uh, from interactions with other traits. So studying just, just trichotillomania, for example, is not going to reveal much about the nature of OCD, because maybe OCD results from a network of, of symptoms that cannot really be studied in isolation. In other words, 
something like the, uh, loss of appetite is not depression-like in itself. It's depression-like once you um, put it in this kind of network. Right. So I think there's this very in interesting interaction here between issues related to measurement and issues about the nature of mental disorders. If you accept a disease model, then there's a sense in which studying a single depression-like trait in isolation might tell you something about the underlying condition. However, if a network model is correct, then there's really no sense in which a trait is depression-like in isolation because it only becomes relevant for depression uh, when combined with other traits. And so presumably testing drugs on this single thing uh, will not tell you much about the efficacy of the drug for depression in general. Right. So let's finish by coming back to where we started. Remember that what we're looking for is a successful metrological extension that would allow us to measure the effect of drugs on depression, depression itself, in animal models. So ideally, it would work something like this. Okay. We have a drug that has an effect on depression, and then we have this fantastic valid measure, the force twin task. Let's imagine it's valid for measuring depression. And then <clears throat> the measure tells us, oh, nice, this drug seems to work. Good. Then what we want to do is uh, um, test this drug in humans, and the Madras scale will say, okay, it works. Nice work, animal people. Animal model people. <laughs> All people are animals. Uh, okay, so that's how it would work in an ideal world without uh, validity drifts. Here's how it actually works, according to me. So um, you test a drug, but in fact, you're not measuring the effect on depression. You're measuring the effect of the drug on something else. And this is where the validity drift occurs. This is where the validity drift occurs. You think you're studying depression, but in fact, you're just studying the effect on something else, namely in the case of the first swing task, stress, stress coping strategies. And because you think you're, you're measuring the right construct, your conclusion will be, oh, it works. The drug works. And then you send that and test it in humans, and people who work with the Madras scale will say, no, what, what are you people doing? Yeah. No funding anymore if you do it too many times. And that's why, in my opinion, that seems to, to be a good explanation for um, why there's a, a general lack of investment from pharmaceutical companies. Here's the thing. This doesn't cost much to pharmaceutical companies. And the um, attrition rate, so the number of drugs that don't work at this level is about 30%. Uh, the attrition rate here is 95%. <laughs> yeah. So 95% of the drugs that make it here is for nothing they will never be put on the market. Okay. And that costs much more. So it would be better to stop drug development here than here. And because they can't stop it here, it has to go here. Uh, they decided they don't want to invest anymore. All right. So in conclusion, we've seen that uh, failed metrological extensions can lead to validity drifts. Uh, researchers end up studying something different from what they originally aimed to study. We've seen um, through several examples that the occurrence of validity drift seems to provide a good explanation. It's probably not the only factor, of course, uh, for repeated failures to identify mechanistically novel drugs for psych psychiatric disorders. Um, after all, it's not surprising that you're not developing efficient drugs if you're actually not testing the drugs on the disorder you wanted to cure. That's totally unsurprising if you think about it this way. And finally, I think there are lessons for the philosophy of measurement in general, uh, namely lessons about how scientists can develop valid procedures and get successful metrological extensions. For instance, we've seen that identifying overlapping domains 
um, is important. Uh, and something I haven't discussed discussed much, much uh, but that, that I discussed in the paper is that um, we are relying too much on phase validity, uh, and that's quite dangerous. Instead, um, new measurement procedures. If you want to avoid, <clears throat> if you want to avoid uh, validity drifts, it's much better to start with a model of the disorder itself and the way in which it interacts is going to interact with the procedure. So that's something that Eran Tal has been calling um, uh, white box calibration that I call uh, model-based calibration in other papers. Okay. So basically the idea is that you're going to calibrate your measurement instruments or procedures by having a by understanding having mod a model of the way in which the procedure itself is going to work. Right. So to finish, I would like to thank my collaborators uh, on this paper that really got me interested in working on, on this topic. So that's a case where we argue that uh, I realized only later that we should call that a validity drift. We argue that um, what people are studying in the case of fear and anxiety disorders really isn't fear and anxiety, but unconscious threat detection. Okay. So we've argued, for example, that um, uh, if you take drugs for anxiety disorders, it's mostly going to reduce the amount to which your hands sweat, your heart beats faster, and so on. And we argue that we, we should instead aim to target those subjective feelings of fear and anxiety. So that's something we've argued. And right now, basically, what I'm doing is take that find a cute name like validity drift and apply that across the board. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we take a two, two minute break as you roll and uh, we'll reconvene in uh, three minutes of today. <laughs> Yes, I'm clicking the hand of right. Sorry, I'm blank, but I went blank and I'm out of time.